for the next 40 minutes, I will uh, entertain you on uh, the recent progress we have been making. First of all, in uh, developing new systems. Uh, we, we love the mesoscopic domain. And so one of the basic mas messages I want to bring across tonight is how these structures can help you to beef up conversion efficiencies and get photovoltaic devices to perform and match the best solid state photovoltaic systems. And so uh, the title page uh, shows the, uh, just the three devices we'll be discussing. That, that's a sensitized uh, solar cell. It uses a uh, new puffer and dye. And, and uh, it's already several years that we published the paper in Science. It was uh, very warmly welcomed and got over 3,000 citations in a few years. So uh, what was new in this paper? Well, it got very high efficiencies by, uh, by chemically designing the sensitizer so that charge would flow and excitation from the top to the bottom of the dye and be injected very rapidly in the oxide semiconductor. So the interfacial charge separation is the initial and the crucial event that, uh, that takes place in the, in, in the molecular photovoltaic devices I will be talking about. And so uh, that's a good example, and I'll dwell on this later on. And to the left, we have a, a, a water cleavage device. Uh, this was a, always a passion of mine, and, and John, good enough to remember when he visited me as a young professor in Switzerland. And uh, we were both dreaming about how to split water by sunlight. And John was working on sensitization, so we were very close in our interest. So here we have uh, the, uh, the uh, photo-induced oxygen evolution on these iron oxide nanorods and nanotrace. And uh, but we need some support, some voltage support, to get the uh, water cleavage complete by hydrogen evolution. So we're using perovskite uh, solar cells. These are new, very promising uh, uh, devices that uh, have the uh, peculiar feature that they develop very high voltages under solar irradiation. So they have very high voltage output, typically over 1.1, even over 1.2 volts. And so we use that voltage to complete the uh, water splitting reaction, to drive the water splitting reaction to completion. So let's uh, get going. And uh, so the, the outline, to, to, I, I talked to you about molecular photovoltaics, weird virtues of mesostructure. And then uh, I will talk to you about electricity and fuel generation, some applications. And so, uh, well, we all know the, uh, the primary act in, uh, in a photovoltaic conversion by a, a sensitized system is that the uh, mo molecular sensitizer gets excited and then injects an electron in the, uh, in the oxide support that serves as an electron selective contact. The dye only injects the electron, not the positive charge in the oxide. So you get the selectivity by choosing the right contact. And so excitation, injection, and then we have to collect this electron, and it will come out and uh, perform work. And uh, you have to bring it back to the sensitizer. Otherwise, you would deplete the dye in no time and oxidize it irreversibly. So we need that very important shuttle that uh, moves electrons back from the uh, back contact or counter electrode to, the, to regenerate the sensitizer. Much of the recent progress in this field has been uh, in the design of new sensitizer molecules, or the molecular engineering of sensitizers. But not only, we had uh, been suffering over 20 years from a, a terrible mismatch between the redox couple that was shuttling the uh, electrons back and forth, which was the iodine triiodide couple and the sensitizer, so about half of the light energy was lost in the regeneration step. But uh, these times are gone. We have new shuttles. 
and I'll tell you more about it later. <laughs> so, so uh, that recently we have seen a surge of uh, of uh, power increase with these systems. They certainly are very very promising and will uh, in inject new uh, di di dynamics into the dial sensitized solar cell research. But uh, this is the beginning, like 50 or 60 years ago, we have Professor Gerischer and uh, so his co-authors, Michel Bialisch, he's still active as a re researcher. They found out just that the sensitization was an electron injection or a whole injection event. But then they also discovered that when you do this on a planar surface, which at that time was the uh, paradigm, you used single crystal zinc oxide electrodes typically, that when you did that, that the, the, the currents, photocurrents, were miserably small. And John will remember when he, he used gerothenium complexes. We, we got some nano amps currents. Very difficult to measure. <laughs> so so uh, that, that was a big uh, drawback. And uh, so the uh, the, 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 the change uh, was dramatic when we, we reintroduced the, the, the mesoscopic scaffold of ox or the oxide. So we introduced simply an, ox an oxide TiO2 colloid or particle network to uh, absorb the sensitizer. You see that uh, configuration here. And uh, you see the dramatic effect that happens when we, uh, when we do that. We, on the top, you have a single crystal uh, oxide electrode cut into the, uh, to the 101 direction. And, uh, and so this is the expensive way, but very inefficient way. The, the, the scale here is incident photon to current conversion efficiency. So you read something like 0.1%. That means one out of a 1,000 photons to strike the electrons at best get converted to electric current. Of course, that's not something you can sell on the market. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, well, but now we go to the cheap, the cheap version, the, 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 uh, the particle film, and we get over 90% conversion. But this was an amazing uh, discovery that was made some uh, 25 years ago. And uh, we found that the uh, external quantum efficiency for, for charge generation was nearly quantitative with those with helium dyes, very similar dyes that actually John had introduced in his research right, when he was in Oxford. And so uh, photocons going up by a, a factor of uh, 10,000. The first, this was such an incredible finding that people questioned whether this was true. They first thought I had made a mistake. <laughs> a young scientist, uh, so I had to travel with my electrodes in a pocket and show them around and convince people it was real. So uh, after a while, uh, the people start believing in the, in the effect, but questions were asked whether the system was stable enough to sustain 100 million turnovers the die has to go through in a 20-year lifetime. And so the charge separation is itself is very quick. Uh, it's, uh, it's done in, a, in a one picosecond. That contributes to stability. Because if the die is de deactivated by electron injection so quickly, it means the excited state cannot undergo competing reactions, or it undergoes at a very, very low efficiency. And that's one of the critical points. The oxidized dye and the excited dye have to be removed quickly. And so here's that fast charge separation event. And we have modeled that uh, the, uh, with uh, Professor Loney from Princeton. And uh, you see the orbital picture, the, uh, the uh, uh, HOMO orbitals on the ruthenium thiocyanate, and the uh, then the first excitation, the excitation event moves electrons to the bipyridyl ligands, and then the injection happens. And so the binding through those carboxylate also very, very important. And we could model, later these dyes were imaged and we confirmed that the, bi 
despite anti twitching bi uh, uh, binding mode was, uh, was prevailing uh, absorption geometry. And so, uh, just to summarize how this, uh, how this charge separation happens, uh, the, uh, the first event very fast, but then questions came, no electric field to separate positive and negative charge, and a lot of disorder in the system. These were three-dimensional disordered systems. So how do you get the, the, the electrons and positive charges out of these films? And so the conditions were clear. If, if you want to get them out, you collect the, the, the carriers, you have to have electron transport will be at least 100 times faster than the recombination. And when you do that, you will collect 99 plus percent. And so, so we could show that uh, in many cases, when you design your dye properly and your electrolyte, you, this condition can be fulfilled. And you get those very high accounts that are delivered by a disordered particle film. And so, uh, so to summarize, then the virtues of the nanostructure, we have uh, this supporting role. It, it absorbs the sensitizer. It uh, extracts the electrons. And, uh, and from the excited state. So it's harvesting sunlight, extracts electrons. But then uh, it also screens the electron charge. The oxide is uh, hydroelectric, has ions on the surface. And so the uh, collection is uh, facilitated. You don't have the back reaction that is imposed or enhanced by the Coulomb attraction. And so here you see a typical representative of the, the ruthenium dyes that were used at, in the beginning of the, uh, this period. And we have the carboxylated bipyridyls. You see how the films turn dark. You just have to put them in dye solution. There's a spontaneous self-assembly that happens. And the dye is pulled in the porous network. And uh, it's absorbed very strongly through those carboxylates to the surface of the oxide. So this is just a visual uh, illustration how the self-assembly of the monolayer happens uh, by a self-limitation. Once you have made the monolayer, there's no more absorbing sites, and the process stops. And all of this was summarized in uh, a paper that came out uh, in Nature just 25 years ago. So. Uh, it uh, collects a lot of citations because uh, it was the first time somebody had used a three-dimensional uh, PN junction, or a junction if you like, it was an electrochemical junction in this case, to uh, convert light to uh, electricity. And uh, you can see the, the red color, that's the ruthenium dye. The uh, conversion reaction is going on as you look at this uh, slide, we see the fan turning uh, from the ambient light that is striking the device. And so this collects light from both sides, front and the back, so it's a bifacial solar cell. And it turned out later that we have actually, in the diffuse light, the record deficiencies when it comes to conversion of ambient light to electricity. The performance is unmatched by any other photovoltaic system. So many other, uh, what should I say, uh, derivatives of this concept on are found. You have the quantum dot sensitization and solid state devices. So I pass over this. And uh, just to, uh, to, to give you a feeling what the research go is going to at, at this stage. Uh, and so the new dyes are being designed. And so the donor acceptor concept is uh, very successful. So you have the donor part, the coma 4 acceptor, and the acceptor is tied to the TiO2 or whatever oxide you use as electron acceptor. And so this is a, a, a good example. We have this famous porphyrin dye. You have a donor function. You have the acceptor function, coma 4 in the middle. And now that gives over 12% efficiency. But we had changed something important. We had moved from the iodide to the cobalt-based electrolyte. Uh, and that was a key, a key element to get higher voltages out of the cells. And so, uh, so the, uh, the loss 
we can see with the iodide, the loss is huge. It's about a half a volt loss. But when we use cobalt complexes, or more recently, uh, uh, the uh, copper complexes, and I'm citing here the work by uh, Marina Freitag. She's, she's actually here at the meeting, and she will give a talk tomorrow afternoon at the one session. So the, the copper and cobalt complexes have become uh, uh, some uh, a real uh, breakthrough in the design of uh, the uh, redox couples that would carry the charges from the um, photoactive electrode to the counter electrode. And graphene was also introduced as a catalyst at the counter electrode. That was important because it cut down our interfacial um, resistance, so electron transfer resistance for interfacial electron transfer by a huge factor. We still don't understand fully why graphene is so much better than, than platinum for these simple one electron autosphere redox couples. But that's a matter of for current investigations. And so uh, there's also a zombie cell that uh, uh, an Anders group and Marina Freitag in Sweden, they were still in Sweden at that time, they, they had one cell that lost the solvent, elect the acetonitriles uh, evaporated, and the cell worked better without the solvent. <laughs> so that was uh, quite a shocking <laughs> observation. And so that has led to the discovery of uh, ho ho hopping conduction in the solid uh, copper complexes that are amorphous solids and conduct by hopping. It's like a whole transporting material that is a solid state whole conductor. And so we have uh, joint forces with uh, Marina and the rest of the group and Anders. And this is our latest paper, which uh, deals with the copper phenantrolene. And this research is going uh, very quickly and making excellent progress uh, to design these new shuttle systems that regenerate the sensitizer at a minimum driving force. Remember, I told you the iodine triiodide, we need 500 millielectron volts, sorry. even more, sometimes 600, to drive the regeneration reaction. So the oxidation of iodide to triiodide is, uh, comes at a very large energy cost. With these, with these copper complexes, we can drive the reaction with 150 millivolts. So the losses become so small that these cells develop uh, open circuit voltages that are over one volt, threatening now the perovskite solar cells. <laughs> it used to be far away from the, uh, the disensitized systems. And because they have this high voltage. And so that's a very interesting uh, evolution. We'll see where we end up with, with these systems. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that the uh, performance of these uh, green dyes, particularly impressive in diffuse light. And uh, at 200 lux, this is a standard for diffuse light up applications. We get 15 microvolt per square centimeter, which matches the best PV cell that is around today, uh, gallium arsenide. Gallium arsenide costs about 200 times more than this cell, but cannot do better <laughs> than the simple dye uh, that, uh, that absorbs light and uh, generates electric charges. So this has led to interest from the commercial side, and uh, so a number of applications have emerged. So uh, some uh, companies are now producing those green panels, and uh, this is a car charging station in near the uh, uh, G2E, it's the company name is G2E, uh, company uh, headquarters in uh, in, in Switzerland, and we see again this uh, charging station. We also have the first installation on our highways in Switzerland, and uh, this uh, one is producing over 1,000 kilowatt hours per year, just using an aesthetically pleasant design. It looks like a green fence, but it's also a sound barrier, okay? So it fulfills several tasks, but the most important one is to generate electric power. And that power then is used to charge electric vehicles. That's, that's the idea behind it. And these are some balconies where you have, uh, I mean, 
This is a, these panels are selling very well. So it's actually a big success for the dye sensitized technology. And the company is producing these cells, it's sold out. If you order today, you have to wait three years to get your pens. I already put my order in for my house, <laughs> and uh, so I will have to wait a little bit. So uh, the other applications from the diffuse light, and I just mentioned the backpack. And we had given one to Al Gore, and he came to Switzerland, and this was actually the last one we had. It was my bag, I had already used it. It was given to Al, and he came by, because our president had run out of the red bags. And also, I, when I met with Bill Gates, I gave him one. He really liked technology. We could power also these uh, keyboards. So, uh, so we, uh, we got a good uh, comment from him, and he, last year, he. He talked about energy innovation and at the Paris conference and mentioned the dye sensitized systems as being a really future, future promise. So there are a number of applications. Let's pass through it quickly. Uh, this is our convention center with the uh, panels. Very nice from inside. It's aesthetically uh, stunning. Here's a. Uh, company in, in Sweden, the uh, company is uh, called Exeter, and they just uh, ramped up the production to 200,000 square meter a year. So, so technology has become a, a commercial commodity, and John, we can be glad something came out of our research. We should, re we should rejoice, <laughs> okay? Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so Let's turn on to uh, health guides, uh, which uh, is also a very nice uh, story. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the health guide emerged. I should insist that <laughs> they, uh, they emerged from very sensitized systems. And uh, of course, uh, they have very interesting uh, properties, strong absorption. And these are amazing solids. and. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the orbital structure is very interesting. You have uh, the valence band maximum being formed by anti-bonding orbitals. And so is the, uh, the conduction band minimum. And so, uh, so if you weaken the bond, for example, we will talk about multi-cation in a minute. We add several cations in the structure we, we, we weaken the bond because the octahedral are not aligned anymore perfectly as they would be in a cubic structure. But weakening the bond means actually stabilizing the structure. You gain energy. So that, that you have to kind of <laughs> get in your brain <laughs> because you weaken the antibonding. Uh, if you weaken uh, something that's antibonding, it becomes less antibonding. That means more bonding. So, so it's a little bit of a mind-boggling thing, but I guess you get used to it after a while. And so uh, yeah, we should get credit to uh, Tommy Osaka for having uh, done the pioneering work on the, di on the sensitized cells and electrolytes first, and, and Namgyu Park followed, and uh, I'll be quick. Uh, so we had, uh, we had then the solid state structures, like, where it reduced, all of this happened four years ago. And then there was a big, a strong rise. Uh, see here the number of publications. This picture was taken in uh, about a year ago. And there was already a thousand publications. After about three or four in the year 2012, a couple of years later, there are 2,000. I mean, it's an amazing observation. And the reason why this was, uh, was uh, such an attraction for research was the very fast growth in efficiency. And we can see the efficiency going up very steeply here. It was uh, 20 percent uh, a year ago, but it's now 22, or even a little bit higher than that. And so, uh, so we had certified our cell efficiency uh, 
if you look at those orange uh, uh, square circles, <laughs> uh, we had an, uh, uh, certification, certification very important. I mean, you can always claim your cell is worth uh, 30%, but uh, in photovoltaics, nobody believes you that. You have to take, if you claim a new record, you have to certify it. And so we did. Uh, we had a new record there, and then, but uh, we thought we had a comfortable lead <laughs> at the end of uh, last year. And, uh, but then uh, Dr. Soak's group uh, from, from Korea, he, within a month, he had beaten us by one percentage point. <laughs> so so uh, this race is still ongoing, and uh, it's, it's very interesting. And we collaborating with uh, Andrew Scharkfeld and his co-workers on those high efficiency devices. We also came up with a sequential deposition of the path guide that facilitated the uh, formation uh, infiltration of the pores. So the, the predecessor lead iodide was infiltrated and then you converted this with methyl ammonium iodide to the path guide. And that has, it goes along with the volume increase by a factor of two, this conversion reaction. And so what you form is some kind of a capping layer so the pores are fully infiltrated after that conversion. And not only that, you have some protruding of the, some of the peroxide protruding beyond the TI2 porous film. That's called a capping layer. And it became very important to have this capping layer, just for reasons of light absorption. The light comes in from the bottom. And so this infiltrated film is only 300 nanometers thick. And so it doesn't. Uh, do uh, enough for light absorption. You need a little bit thicker film, so you need that capping layer. But just think about it. This, uh, this whole film thickness is uh, about 300 nanometer. Silicon is 300 microns. So we have a factor of 1,000 less material to use than in a silicon solar cell. And you have seen before, if I go back here, the, the current efficiency 22.1 beats beats the uh, polycrystalline silicon <laughs> on, the, uh, on the small margin, but this is a market leader, OK? So uh, within a couple of years, out of nothing comes a cell that beats a market leader that has been developed at the cost of billions of dollars, <laughs> OK? And, uh, and uh, uses a thousand times more material with high purity than uh, the perovskite solar cells. So you can understand the fascination with those systems. And so I, very quickly, oh, wow, I better rush. So the, the presently, we have the most efficient systems are, are the uh, are, are, are mixed cations and anions. So, this, so we start off with the former medium methyl ammonium. So these are the two cations. There are reasons why they're better. They have better optical, better electronic properties. I will, I will not dwell on this. Let me just say one thing. When you take the form amidinium uh, perovskite, so form amidinium lead iodide, it's not making a perovskite phase at room temperature. It forms a useless yellow phase. But you add a little bit of methyl ammonium, it forms the perovskite phase. So the mixing stabilizes. The mixed, these mixed cation phases. And so uh, to cut a long story short, I'll for fast forward. I'm not chairman, how much time do I have left? I seem to have started a little bit later than <laughs> what I thought. So. Yeah, we started a little late. You can have like 10 minutes. OK, that's very generous. Thank you. And so I make a fast forward. We have that stabilization effect. This is, this is particularly striking when you look at the form amidinium and cesium cation. You take the cesium lead iodide, yellow phase at room temperature. The form amidinium, again, a yellow phase. So the two are useless. But you mix them, you get the black phase form. And, uh, and that's a, this has been a stunning development. It's, there is some, uh, the main reason is the anthropic stabilization, but not only. The mixing also facilitates as energy. The free energy is, uh, is negative for forming the perovskite because of this mentioned to you, the, the anti-bonding orbitals. They get the 
destabilized, which means you stabilize the structure. And so today, we are just published uh, on Thursday last week. We published a paper in science that has a whole cascade. Can you see it's rubidium, cesium, methamonium, homomidinium. It's a whole cation cascade. And so the whole development has gone to, to uh, these uh, mixed cation, mixed anion systems. And they're extremely uh, stable. Uh, here's a test where we run, subject the cell to continuous light soaking with full sunlight, but at 85 degrees, not at normal temperature. This was kind of a, kind of a a uh, double whammer, if you like, <laughs> okay? You put the light on and you put the heat on. It's not really a requirement for, for normal stability measurements. But the student wanted to check it. And so he put both the heat on and the light on, and he ran the cell in maximum PowerPoint mode. So the power was drawn all the time, over hundreds of hours, and with, with good stability. So that shows that these uh, mixed cation formulations are very, very stable. And so they also have a high luminescence. That goes along with the effect that they show high voltage. If you have a high open circuit voltage, then uh, you see the correction term here is negative because phi is the external quantum of efficiency of electron luminescence smaller than one. So uh, the weaker your luminescence, the less you get voltage out. And why is that? Well, entropy, again. If you have radiation less recombination, your quantum efficiency for light emission goes down, and you should generate heat, and so you pay for it. So it's actually easy to understand why there is this correlation between the light emission and the voltage of a photovoltaic device. And we can build actually light emitting diode with the same cell, here's the light emitting diode of the two contacts, that is used as a very highly efficient photovoltaic device. This is on scale-up, but uh, we have also used these systems in the generation of hydrogen oxygen from sunlight. And here I, I move very quickly. The, uh, the first guide is used to beef up the, uh, the iron oxide, as I showed you in my title slide. And uh, so iron oxide has a problem that you, you have very short carrier diffusion length. And, uh, but the nanostructuring helped to address that problem. So for a while, we were using uh, these uh, cauliflowers. And so the key effect here is that the photogenerated carriers, they, uh, they can only diffuse over a very small distance. But the light absorption length is much longer than the, the carrier diffusion length. So how do you deal with that problem? Well, the nanostructuring is, is a solution. Since individual particles have a feature size of only a few nanometers, so the carriers don't have to go over long distance before they hit the water and react with it. So here's the uh, above, as you see those iron oxide particles forming oxygen bubbles, and uh, the rest, of course, does nothing. So I showed you this uh, combined system for water splitting. We have a similar thing on Cooper's oxide. We also use the uh, path guide for, uh, as a voltage source for water splitting. And uh, we got 12.3% conversion efficiency. That was a, it was a big jump forward. Recently, we have used a very similar system to convert CO2 to CO, so carbon dioxide fixation. At that time, we had 6.5 solar to CO. Today, we had 14% solar to CO. So let me finish, because my time is, is up. And, and just uh, at the very end, I want to, uh, to uh, share with you some emotional <laughs> moments I lived uh, last year. So, so we're seeing here the electric car and the fuel car. These things will come into being. They're already commercially sold. And so the systems we develop uh, can be very useful for serving a future market where hydrogen is needed, solar hydrogen and solar electricity. And so uh, here's a pioneer. Uh, this uh, person is Nick Hayek. He's the inventor of the swatch. I think all of you know what a swatch is. It's a Swiss watch, okay? 
And so, uh, so he has several watches on his, you see, three watches. So, so, uh, so but he was also a, a genius. He was uh, a, a, a true visionary, and he built a smart car. He wanted this smart car to be electric or hydrogen driven. But then Mercedes came and they put a normal <laughs> engine in it. But today you can get an electric uh, smart car. So he was right. He's, he's, he passed away, unfortunately, but uh, he, he had the right vision. And he also thought that we should have the distributed uh, solar fuel generation by having these units on each house and you had your own little uh, fuel uh, tank in the, in the basement and run your car on it. So, uh, well, at the very end, uh, I'm, uh, I want to share with you the, uh, what happened on my birthday last year. Uh, I visited uh, the uh, Australian pavilion of the World Exhibition, which was, uh, uh, the expo was in Milano in Italy. And uh, you see this disc, it was actually Dyson Stress solar cells uh, from an Austrian company called SFL. You see that forest behind it, this is, the Austrians had built a forest and this disc. That was actually their exhibit, okay? And so, uh, so that was the, it's the disc how it uh, looks like in uh, at dawn. And, uh, and this is my wife, Carol. We have this, the same day, on our birthday is on the 11th of May. So, the two of us got this birthday cake, a uh, green box you can see. But what really delighted the two of us most was uh, the charging station that was running on the DSC panels, a 16 kilowatt charging station. And so, uh, so if you go back in our younger years, and I'm looking at chart, <laughs> we both are still young chart. So, but would we have dreamed, uh, dreamed when we, we were working on these nano amps for square centimeter, these cells that didn't last, that you could, could get kilowatt power and power a truck with molecules, molecular devices, molecules that turn light to electric power. So with that, I finish, my time is up, and uh, I, I, I first, uh, like, before I really finish, I would like to thank the three chairmen. <laughs> I forgot to do that in the beginning. So uh, thank you so much for, uh, for having invited me. And uh, thank you all for your attention. Uh, I go back. <laughs> this, this sponsor, Skiing Day in Switzerland, very important. Thank you for your attention.